Hey guys, good evening everybody and welcome to Community Conversations with Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine. I am Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine and I am so excited um, and happy to have you here uh, for Community Conversations. If this is your first time joining us, welcome and thank you for tuning in. And I certainly hope that this is not your last time joining us. Um, for those of you who are joining, uh, make sure that you share this broadcast with your friends or invite your friends to watch because it's going to be a really, really uh, great um, conversation. And so uh, I just want to uh, first, I guess, tell you guys a little bit about Community Conversations and how it got its start. So Community Conversations started um, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we were all home. Everybody kind of was home and uh, a lot of folks were on social media kind of asking questions about different things. And so I started going live on a more regular basis uh, to bring you information about the city, what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how we can, um, and, and how I can answer your questions. And then it just uh, so happened that there were so many things going on that there were more, um, there were other community things that we needed to talk about in addition to COVID-19. And so uh, we started the community conversation opportunity or community conversations as an opportunity just to kind of start talking. Um, and so I've been trying to bring you some great uh, topics, great folks. Um, and tonight is no exception. So I'm going to add him tonight. I'm really, really excited because you guys, I'm um, going to introduce to some and represent to others um, the amazing Perry Bradley. And um, I have wanted to get Perry on here for probably about two months now. And just uh, with my schedule, I was like, okay. And then finally last week, I was like, okay, Perry, I need to get you on. Um, and he was like, sure, anytime. And he actually was so um, so accommodating. He was willing to come on like within two hours of me um, asking him. And I was like, no, I want an opportunity uh, to certainly make sure people know and tune in. So we scheduled him to come on today. And I'm really excited to have uh, Perry. Um, for those of you who don't know Perry, he is the founder and executive director of Building Better Communities. And we'll talk a little bit about what is Building Better Communities and what they're doing in our community. Um, but I, I just had to give a, a personal story that um, I met Perry um, several years ago. Those of you who know me and follow me and have followed me for a while, you guys know that I have um, very engaged kids. Um, but of course, my oldest is um, a little activist herself. And um, she's very engaged politically, uh, socially, um, and she is always wanting to do things. And so uh, Perry had reached out to me um, um, after uh, the shooting um, at um, Parkland. And Perry was doing things with uh, youth. Um, she, he was doing March for Our Lives and doing things with youth, with gun violence and things, and um, asked me if, um, if Jamie and I could participate and I wanted to, but a schedule with my schedule, I wasn't able to. And so um, I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to, to help um, or come. And then I was talking to my little one and she was like, what are you doing this weekend, mommy? Because I really want to go to this event. And I was like, huh, you know, look at God. Mom, I was just asked to come and mommy said I couldn't. So I, I called Perry and I was like, you know, look, it's being super mom that I am. Got to uh, do what my parent, my children want. My, my baby wants to come to this. I have uh, an existing engagement, but I'm going to tell them that I can't stay. I just got to go do do my city council duties over there and then uh, come over. And I was like, can can she stay with you? Can I drop her off with you? Let her volunteer work, do whatever. But she really wants to be there. And he was like, yeah. And so that's that was kind of my first personally getting to know Perry. And so I give that story because of, of a couple of reasons. Number one is that Perry's been working in our community for so long. And for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to meet him, I know that tonight you'll be equally as impressed as I am with him, with his passion and his drive and his commitment to this community. Uh, but I think it's also um, important um, earlier this year when there were a lot of conversations, we were having marches and I talked talk, talk to a lot of people and I shared this before is that was a little disheartened because I, I heard people either on social media or just in different circles um, criticizing the way people were sharing their voice. You know, people who were marching were saying, oh, uh, they were criticizing people who weren't marching. People who weren't marching were criticizing people who were marching. Um, you know, some people were like, I really want to do something and I don't know what to do. And, I, you know, and I, I shared before is that 
you know, we all have our gifts and talents and God uses us all in different ways. And we've got to use our voices in a way that is best suited for us. But after we march, after we rally, after we protest, after we do all of that, we got to then take all that energy, all that um, drive and commitment and desire and put it into work in the community. And so Perry has done that for many, many years. Um, and continues to do that. And so I wanted to bring him on tonight. Uh, this is what I'm calling my my community engagement week. I'm going to talk to uh, uh, several people this week that are doing amazing things in the community. And I want, if you don't know about what they're doing, I hope that you guys learn more. And as always with community conversations, I want you to uh, figure out which what's your action item after tonight. Uh, how can you support Perry and what he's doing? How can you do similar things in your community? Um, because I know there are folks who are not local uh, who watch this show. And so how can you do some other things in your community? So with that long, long, long introduction, um, I'm excited. Welcome, 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 Perry, to Community Conversations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Apologize for the drive. I had to go take care of mom, but I'm headed back to Columbia now. And that is no apology. I mean, I, I just, I love that, that, you know, you do so much. Uh, but, you know, as, as we all know, you know, our parents come first and when our parents um, have need us, we're, we're there. And so Harry is coming back from um, taking his mom to the doctor. And, and so that's just big ups to you um, as as a as a man who is up there doing things. Um, so uh, I want to say we got Latasha Tace says good afternoon. Hey, Latasha. Good to see you. Hey, Meryl Johnson. Hey. I love Meryl. Hey, y'all. Meryl says hey, y'all. Um, and then Sam, Sam, you and I got to connect because you've been blowing up my timeline over the last couple of days. So I definitely want to connect with you. But he said, we need to have those guidelines before we march and have people on the same page. Yeah. Um, and Sam, that's something we can talk about, too. Um, he, that's a point he's making about having guidelines before we march to make sure people are on the same page. Um, and so that's certainly something. But anyway, so Perry, I've given kind of my personal, um, how I've met you and how I personally connected with you. Um, but if you could um, just tell us a little bit about you. Um, like I said, you've been working in the community a long time. So tell us uh, about you, your background, and really what was your impetus to start uh, doing the work that you do? Well, um, just to give you a heads up, um, my father, and my mother instilled in me a long time ago, just about community. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I came from um, a poverty stricken background, but I come from a background where we, we love our community. We did a lot for our community. So it was always in me. Um, even from a little boy, I remember my mom, would, my grandmother really would volunteer me for everything that the church had going on, everything that community, um, organizations had doing so i was always doing something when i went to college clemson university um i pledged cap Alpha yo yo and um <laughs> you know i was the guy right chair just to give everybody an idea of this is how much this is in me even as a teenager uh, i knew that i wanted to do community service um one of the biggest things i hated in college because i, I went back long 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 time ago they didn't have um are, are majors where you could do um, nonprofit work. Now that's actually a major at Clemson. So, you know, working in the community has always brought me a sense of accomplishment. Um, I feel like, you know, God has blessed me. What am I doing for the people next to me? I come from, you're always, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And so if there's a weak link and I'm talking about in my people, then that's me. You know, I'm, I'm, as, I'm only as strong as the people around me. So when I see all the things that are going on, I feel like that's also a part of who I am. And that's what makes me do what I do. A lot of people don't realize um, when I met you and we were putting together the March for Our Lives event, that event was huge. And, you know, we, we um, didn't know what we were going to do, didn't have no funding. People don't realize that a lot of that came out of my pocket. Um, my wife looked at me like I was crazy, but that's just how important it was. We, we've always been one to just do, and we figured, you know, God will make a way. And honestly, you know, he did. Um, you couldn't do the event. 
Mayor Benjamin couldn't do the event, and I just prayed on it. And and then when the event came around, guess what? You were there. The mayor was there. I mean, everybody was there. They showed up, and somehow or another, you guys all made it. And that, that's why I say I always believe that he'll make a way. And I appreciate everything that you guys have been doing in the community. And one of the things that's best with me is I learned um, several years ago, I had a cousin, Devin Taylor. We were at an event. I was just getting to know my family again closely. And Devin left to leave and go to the store and was pulled over by a state trooper. This is right here in something. Was pulled over by a state trooper. They got into an altercation and the state trooper shot him twice and killed him. Um, Devin was unarmed, and this is like right around the time a lot of African American males had been getting shot by police officers. Um, of course, we were angry and upset, but one of the things we did do is I reached out, I met Sheriff Lott, and I, and you know, he was able to help me get some of the answers for my family. So, you know, instead of taking that bitter chip on my shoulder saying, Hey, I hate police, I actually took that opportunity to say, I don't want another one of my brothers to die for something like this so what we did was we partnered with law enforcement and we go into communities and we try to figure out what's the best scenarios for us to actually live and that's the easiest way i can say it because we all know that you know things happen and they get out of control fast and we pay the price so you know that's why my past that's where my passion comes from really is making sure that my weakest link becomes stronger because anytime a young black man is killed in the community, whether it's a police officer, whether it's gang violence, whether it's suicide, you know, I feel, I hurt. You know, one of the biggest things my wife, she still doesn't understand is how I don't have a nervous breakdown because all the pain in our community, I bring that home. And in some way I find a way to kind of just keep that inside of me, but that pain it hurts. People believe that if it doesn't happen in you, then you can get through it. But people don't realize if you really truly care about your community, all the things that go on in your community really truly affect you. So that's where my passion comes from. I apologize for being long winded. No, no, that is good. And I'm, I'm I just invite those of you who might be still just joining us, um, come in and say hi. Um, give us any questions. I've got several based on what you just said. Um, but <laughs> certainly, if y'all have any questions, let us know. But there's a lot to unpack there, what you just said, Perry, but let me just start with um, kind of that whole passion of, of working in the community and want to do things in the community. There are so um, many people who want to work within the community, but they just kind of don't know where to start. Um, how did you kind of get your starter? How did you figure out like where to, to focus and channel your gifts and your talents and, and get started? Church. church. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I can't say enough. Church is, is the, the one thing that I had instilled in me from the beginning that um, has always, that has never let me down personally. And, and so, you know, it helped. I mean, I, I, I was close. My family is always close to the pastor. We're like that family that, you know, that they talk about when the new pastor comes in and that's the family you got to make sure you get to know. We're the family that invite the pastor to dinner the first. You know, so that's my family. Um, you know, so, you know, we see, or well, I saw, um, people that would call into the church and say they need their light bills paid. People that would call in and say, Johnny just got locked up and he needs bail money. I don't know what to do. People who will call and say, um, you know, someone just died. So I've seen all that coming up. When I played my fraternity, we, we did a lot of stuff in the community. And, you know, when you got a, a small town like Clemson and, and Pendleton is right next to it, you see a lot of things that we struggle through that, that happened to us. So, you know, it, it, if you have a heart and, and you see these things personally going on, you can't help but be affected. So my passion comes from just that. That is what got me started and feeling the way I feel. Just seeing how much people needed help and seeing how the pastors in the church were, were used to be there for the people and i don't know about now and everything but how they used to be you know there was a time when if johnny got locked up the, the village stepped in now i think people just kind of uh, they, they don't want to be bothered with it but that's that's how i am and so i do my best to try to be there for the people 
that other people are not there for. Donta is on. Hello, Donta. She says, exactly. Passion for others in your community. Um, thank you for joining us. And the Kia's on too. Kia says, good evening. So good evening, Kia. Um, and y'all make sure y'all share the um, broadcast and, and or invite your friends to watch and hear what Perry has to say. Um, you know, you, you touched that. Uh, 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 that is really true is that you see there are so many needs. But I guess that that's also my question is like, so there are so many. So how do you focus on, you know, what it is? Because, I mean, it's overwhelming and you have a passion for helping everybody, but you can't be everything to everybody. So how do, how do you focus? And then how, how did you kind of hone in on what building better communities would, would start doing? You have to look at what, what is really close to you. Um, this is a story I'm going to share. When I was younger, maybe about five or six, I had an uncle that left a loaded firearm um, in a den. Me and my cousin grabbed that loaded firearm, and we were outside playing cops and robbers, and she pulled the trigger. I put my hands up, and the bullet lodged in my hand. And I put my hand up, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you today. Gun violence is, is so important to me only because, and I'm saying only, but because I've actually survived it. You know, I don't tell a lot of people this, so I'm, I'm going to say it now, but not only was I shot because the gun was left out, I have been carjacked in Atlanta and shot at. Um, and so it's a scary feeling to deal with gun violence. I've had a friend of mine that was also a capital going through a lot to actually commit suicide. And so gun violence has always been something that's really been true to my heart. Oh, and it's because I honestly, because I lived it. I, I've actually know what it feels like to be shot and to know how important gun safety is in our community. You know, people don't realize gun violence is not just somebody shooting. You. Gun violence entails really, you know, accidental shootings, suicides, um, domestic violence, all these things come up under gun violence. So I focus on just that. And when you talk about gun violence, you can't help but bring in law enforcement. So everything ties in together. Yes, I would love to end poverty, but I know that I can't, like you said, you can't do all things, so you have to focus. My focus and strength on gun violence, I hope, brings about rev uh, options to end poverty because all of this ties in together, but I focus on just that one, and I go from there. Natasha says, really important issues that small communities experience still today. It, it is. And it's it, it just like as you hearing you talk, it, it is. It's like you have to think about kind of the things that impact your life. Um, and, and I've shared this. So many people have probably heard this. Um, but I remember um, when I was first elected uh, or when Jamie and I were first married, he was working. Uh, he's a manager at the housing authority. And we had just gone to the Columbia Urban League um, dinner and we were coming home. And as soon as we got home, he got a call uh, that was that was just shooting over at T.S. Martin Park. Um, and so uh, we went over there and um, found out that um, that two children had been shot. Um, and I, I'll, I'll always say I will always say their names. So we never forget Courtney Dixon and Terrence Merchant. And when Courtney and Terrence were, were killed, um, they and a 17-year-old killed them. That was three families. There was three children, three children whose lives were drastically altered and three families that were changed forever. And that always just sticks to me. And I, I still keep in touch with Courtney's um, family. Um, but I think about it, that, that has impacted me so much when I think about youth violence. And so even this summer, uh, when knowledge was killed um, and Adontis was shot, um, again, I will always say their names because I want people to know that these are not statistics. These are babies. These are babies in our community and we have got to, we've got to affect that. So I, I thank you for what you do because it is, it's a lot. Um, so with, let's talk about building better communities. What are some of the things that you are doing in the community to, to try and address some of these issues and needs that you see? 
Well, one of the biggest things um, we we did uh, before COVID nineteen monthly we would have a uh, round table. I know you, you remember me probably inviting you a couple of those, but we would have that gun violence round table where we would go into a different community that had just been affected by gun violence so that we can talk about it. Uh, we try to go out and help people that have been affected by gun violence. And, you know, that's, you know, because people don't realize we as blacks do not like counseling. You know, we, we try to handle it all ourselves and we don't have the church structure that we used to have where you can get that counseling in the church. So, you know, we try to go out to the people and be that. Not saying we're a pastor. Not saying we, you know, we know everything, but we try to listen. A lot of times people just need somebody to talk to and to vent. So we go out and become advocates for the victims of gun violence. Uh, we also just opened up a resource center in the Colony Apartments. Um, could have had it somewhere else, but I thought that would be the best place because if you're there, you know you can affect more change. Now when people say they want to work with BBC, they have to come to the colony apartments just to do that. So that brings more resources to the area, and I love that. Um, you know, we, we continue. We just did the Caravan of Love with Ivory Thigpen, with Dr. Ivory Thigpen, I'm sorry. But um, that brought about, uh, we talk about hate crime laws. We need these laws in place. So we're, we're doing, we're trying to push right now, just um, really being a voice for the people that need to be heard and a quiet voice. We're not yelling and screaming because I believe there are organizations for that. And, and I applaud them for what they do. You know, one of the biggest things, we teamed up with Black Lives Matter. And I believe that that's going to be one of the best organizations that we can team up with, only because if you think about what's going on, I think that if people learn their roles, we can be more effective. My role is not to organize a protest, but my role also is to help protesters learn, like you say, how to march, learn what to ask for, do the research, because they need it. You know, you can't go out and protest and march and not know what you're protesting about except for the fact that you're mad because then all you've done is just created a scene and gained nothing out of it. So we're teaching organizations right now uh, the best, most effective way to protest. And so we're that behind the scenes. I know I was told one time that it's better to be a king maker than to be the king. <laughs> so BBC is taking that lesson and, and we learned it from a great pastor too, but we, we want to help be king makers and not so much as the kings. And when you do that, people kind of respect you more because it's not always about you at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. Meryl Johnson says, random thought to all who are watching, complete your census and register to vote. And it's really not a random thought, Meryl, because that is so important. I mean, like when we talk about, and we, I, I went to, uh, shout out to, to China Phillips, who is heading the Columbia's Complete Count Committee. Uh, but we, uh, Jamie and I and the family, we went out to Latimer Manor yesterday. They were doing, they were registering people to vote. They had the census. Um, but I was talking to a young lady, a couple young ladies out there. Um, and one young lady, um, she has eight children. And we were talking just about resources. And Jamie was talking to them about school and everything. But I was, I was explaining kind of the connection to the census is that the census, based on our numbers, we get a return on the money that we spend. Our taxpayer, our federal taxpayer dollars go to Washington. They come back based on formulas, based on the needs of our community. And when we don't complete the census, we do not get uh, the resources that we need to build more parks, to build more schools, to invest in sidewalks. I mean, all those are really, really important. So that's so key. And yeah, voting is key. I know people get tired of voting. Uh, hearing people say I, um, you got to vote, but having people in office who can actually bring the change about that you want to see. And I, t I said this the other day, I was talking about uh, Representative Wendy Brawl. She's introduced some amazing, I mean, some great legislation. But, you know, right now with the House of Representatives in South Carolina, unless you get more people in the House, there's a lot of great bills that get introduced, but they don't go anywhere uh, because you don't have enough people who are elected to to get those things passed. So that's not random. Um, Sam talked about, uh, Sam said, yes, gun safety. And we definitely got to reach out to our youth. I took a, C a CWP class 
and I didn't know half of the information. <laughs> That's so important, Sam, because um, we, we've got to get in, involved in our youth. And that is what you're doing, um, uh, Perry. And and so going back to our first interaction with the March for Our Lives, um, it was really powerful because you had kids out there. Um, and I remember um, you had um, Senator Pinckney's daughter spoke. Uh, she was one of the speakers. Um, you know, you had kids. My daughter was volunteering. I mean, it was really it, it was really powerful to see those kids. And we know, you know, and I, like I said, that was after Parkland. We know that Parkland really started a whole movement of young people doing stuff. And we saw this summer how there were so many young people who were out there really engaging. How are you um what, the way BBC is working, how are you reaching the youth and actually bringing them along um, to be involved in your efforts? We actually empower them. Um, one of the biggest things we do, and I don't know if you've been following lately, but anything that I youth do, that's what we focus on. That becomes the highlight. You know, one of the, I want to say this, and um, Aja Charles, um, the, the artist, do you know her? She, um, if you go to our, if you go to our site, we have um, in our new building we have this mural of Dr. King, and she painted that in two days, off of just what I told her I wanted. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Yes. Oh, oh yeah, I've seen yeah. her work. Yes. We did it. We did a bit. And so what we did was even on our website we showcased her. So what we've been doing is the young people we've been showcasing. You know, we have so many people. Even when the Caravan of Love, when we just did this event. We had a young man from high school that um, actually spearheaded a lot of the work. We put him in charge. When you put them in charge, you'd be amazed at what they know and what they're able to do. And so I'm, I'm very proud of our young people. And so we even have the, um, the youth, the BBC Youth Council. We even have a millennial chamber of commerce. A lot of people don't know these things because we're quiet. And, you know, we just make sure we want to get the work done. But the, we've always focused on making sure the next generation understands what's going on. And I'm going to be in some light in a minute, so <laughs> just bear with me. But <laughs> um, yeah, and we're, we're focused yeah. on just making sure that the younger generation, even the beautification project that we're doing right now, we pay young people to help us um, clean up yards and do everything in the communities. Things that normally people will go and hire um, lawn care service for. We got young kids um, in the community doing that, and we put food on the table. We paid them. So it's not, and we pay them $20 an hour, so it's not like they don't get good pay. Even though it's not a lot, I wish we could do more, but we could. I mean, James Sanders just um, just helped me do something, was yesterday, with the building. He brought some kids along. I mean, and we paid them cash money right there on the spot, and he said, you know, we need more jobs. These kids need jobs. They hungry. They 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 can't focus and they can't do things because they're worried about the wrong things. If you got to worry about whether your lights gonna be on or if you're gonna have food on the table, you need resources that are actually gonna help empower you. And this younger generation is growing up so fast. They are they are, and and that is so key because there are opportunities. We do need to think about things that we can get our kids engaged in. And some of the things they they can just take it to another level that we wouldn't even be able to do. I mean, the ideas that they bring to the table. Um, so I love that. So tell me, uh, let's talk specifically about what you are doing in the colony, because, um, you know, a lot of folks want to a lot of folks um, talk about different areas um, and where there are issues, um, you know, where the colony is, there's colony, there's North Point, uh, you got Bayberry, uh, but you have um, a, a lot of families with young kids concentrated in, a, a, in in one area. And so we definitely need to make sure that we are supporting those families, giving those kids what they need, giving those moms what they need, and being able to, you know, address the needs in the community, as well as, you know, continue to help uh, bring it up. So tell us about kind of what what is, what is BBC doing over in the colony? Okay, when we got the office, um, thank you for the, the mayor, um, Great Southern Homes, Charter Communication. We were going to start with just a library and a resource center. Um, with COVID-19, that's kind of hard to do, but we do know with the kids trying to go back to school now, 
um, in, um, internet and, and being able to have the right equipment is so important for them to be able to learn how they get left behind. The mayor, however, surprised us. Um, and I'll, I'm not sure of all who's involved with this, but they took it a step level, a level, a level higher. And um, with our um, organization in that community, they're actually providing free internet for every residence in those areas. I think you had something you know about that, right? So, you know, I don't know if it's a surprise or not. I'm sorry if I broke it, but no, um, no. okay. But but you guys have that that was wonderful. I mean, that you know, people think it's all about what you do, but it's what sparks and what comes out of what you're doing that's key. And to have everyone over there with internet, that's amazing. What we're working on now is getting laptops because everyone there trying to use a cell phone to do work is very hard, especially on a small screen. So we're trying to get the resources there to make sure that everyone in that area has access to everything everybody else has. You know, we believe that if they have, um, you know, equal playing grounds, our kids can exceed just as well as anybody else. Uh, we're also doing life skill courses. People thought, well, why are you doing life skill courses? Well, I'll be honest. There are a lot of young parents in those areas that really need help with just day-to-day -day things, um, how to open up bank accounts, um, you know, child rearing, um, getting the most bang for your buck, even simple things like um, house um, chores and what you need to do um, to keep up your home, to fix things, you know, everything that can empower you to get away from the system and start depending on yourself is what we're trying to teach in that community. So that's what we're bringing. We did the the um the the um what you call it the blood drive Friday, and we caught a little slack for that. And I, I'm I'm still trying to figure that one out because people say, oh well, plasma. Uh oh, Perry. I think did we got cut out? Yeah, but there you go. Okay. You're back. <laughs> All right. Listen, I'm about I'm about to. Well, when you get forty dollars. Um, per person in a house, that's a lot of resources. I'm not saying that's a lot, but I mean, that, that can take care of your groceries for a couple of days. That can help you put money on your light bill. You know, that's a lot of stuff that you can do that people don't realize. So, you know, anytime someone complains about what we do, I always say, hey, step it up. If we bring 40, you bring 50. But if you're not going to step it up, just participate. Help it become an even more, a greater success. And I think that's one of the biggest things we're starting to see now is all the things we do in that community. You get a lot of opposition because you tell people to register to vote. You got people out there saying, hey, don't need to vote. Vote don't matter. But vote, voting matters. Holding our people accountable. We want to teach them how to do that. So that's some of the things that we're doing in that community. So, and like I said, again, y'all, if y'all have any questions for, for Perry, please go ahead and put them in the chat. But let me ask you this and, and, and real talk. Um, I mean, I think part of the challenge typically is when you have communities that have, have been, and I say this as an elected official, I, I, I hear it, I know it. And I know that, you know, sometimes people probably look at me as an elected official and say, I'm part of that problem, <laughs> but you have communities that, because they have been traditionally left behind, uh, there is a level of distrust, um, and some of it rightfully placed, um, yes. for people coming in the community, working, trying to empower them. Because, you know, there are folks who have been in communities and then they leave. There are folks who come in the community and they make lots of promises um, and, and don't deliver. Um, so there's a lot of there, there's a lot of that. How do you, how do you break through that, and how do you get through that level of um, you know distrust or people or that skepticism that people have about well why why is he here trying to do this what what's in it for him how do you get past that consistency I don't care what a person tells me if I know what's in my heart you can say whatever you want to say about me but you can't say I ever gave up on you um, you know we started out in the Colony apartment several years ago. We used to do like an event that's in that field in the back. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And so, you know, it was nothing back there but grass and opportunity. And we've been back there since then. So I tell people all the time, if you want to talk about what we do, fine. Go back and see what we've done. We've done so many programs in that area and we've stayed consistent. And I'm saying this without money. So people don't realize we don't get paid to be out there. 
I think people know. I think every time people hear about an organization, they think the organizations are getting paid. They think we're getting rich, and that's not the case. Y'all gotta forgive me. I'm walking in the house, but um, right. <laughs> we, we we don't get rich doing these programs. This is not a, a get rich thing. I do this out of my pocket most of the time. So people don't realize if you're doing something genuinely, it's nothing people can say to you. If it's in your heart, just keep doing it. If people got a problem with it, show them. You're right. They don't trust anybody coming in because they think everybody has an um, alternative motive. But if you stay there and keep going, keep doing what you do, I think you'll wear them down. A lot of people, you know, they talk about elected officials. They come back for election time and that's it. I'm there all year long. So let me ask this. So the, the another question that, that came up with what you just said, the reality though, you're, you're right. Okay. So a lot of it you do out of your pocket because I've seen you and I've, I've seen your, your giving. Um, and I know there are a lot of folks who want to, to do similar things. They want to be in the nonprofit space. They want to work. They want to work in the community. Um, but they also have families. They got to eat too. So, I mean, how, how do you balance that? Because, I mean, real talk, I mean, you, you want to help the community, but, you know, just like people say um, through COVID and everything else, but they talk about um, self-care and, and when you go on the airplane, they say, you know, you got to put your mask on yourself before you, you put your mask on others. And I, I have a good friend who always says, um, I, have a, I have a heart to help others, but I can't help others to the point where I'm in the same position of the people that I'm trying to help. So that's exactly yeah. right. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is how do you do it when it doesn't it, it's it's not big money, but you still have to you gotta eat, you gotta you gotta support your family. How do you do that? And how do you get to the point where you are working, but you're still able to support your 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 organization so it can grow, but you're also able to support your household? You make sacrifices. And you make big sacrifices. Now, what I'm gonna try to do real quick, can I join in from my laptop now? Or uh-huh. You join I, in and then I will yeah, I can switch you out. So join in before on. before we disconnect the other one. Uh oh, hold on, it's telling me I need something. Uh, you don't have the you still got the link? Yeah, I do. It's telling me I need Chrome. I gotta download it real quick. Okay. I will say but, don't uh, well, to quit. Well, Donta put, and she had a comment. She said, very important, organizations need leadership. I think she was saying that when you were talking about, you know, how you guys are trying to build uh, capacity in other people to do similar things. So that's true. And, and we, we need to talk about that too, about capacity building, because we do know there are so many needs in the community. So like I said, we all have our role to play and there there's enough work to be done in the community that people don't have to be everybody, you know, well, this is my my territory, or this is my group, or whatever. There's enough work <laughs> to be done in the community, so we just all got to kind of get you know buckle down and figure out what needs to happen. So I do want to talk about capacity building as well. But go back, you were going to address the about the sacrifice and how do you still support your your household while doing all this good work in the community? Well, you you make major sacrifices. Um, I've learned a long time ago. Even my dad helped me with this, and my wife would tell you. I don't drive a new car. I, I mean, I love new cars. I love gadgets. I love a lot of things, but nothing I have. I mean, my truck is a 2007 and I don't, I don't buy a lot of stuff. When you get older, I don't need $300 Nikes. I don't need expensive clothes. I can shop at Walmart. And so those sacrifices I make help me to help the masses the most. Now I don't take anything out of my, my family's mouth, meaning, my family comes first before the community when it comes to my resources. So once home is taken care of, then what I have for the community is what I have for the community. And, and you know, my wife would tell you, when I first get paid, she gets the money right off the top. I just hand it to her and be done with it. That, that's the, and, and fellas, that's the easy way to do it. You got a good woman at home. I just hand her the money and I'm done. But, you know, my thing with that is, and, and even saying that, you know, there's so much stuff that needs to be done that if I were to be selfish and buy me a nice ride and have me expensive clothes and buy me the shoes I really want and, 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 and 
I guess splurge like I, you know, like I work, you know, don't get me wrong. I bust my tail. I work three jobs just so one job I have enough money for me to give back to the community or I do favors for someone in exchange for a community, um, you know, donation. And that donation is not really money, but it can mean they give us food or they give us transportation we need or they give us bouncy houses and I do some work for them. You know, so I make a lot of sacrifices that people don't even know about and people probably will be amazed that I make. But anybody, you know, if they see me, they know. I make it look good now. Don't get me wrong. I make it look good. But I, I just don't indulge in a lot of things that I normally would have. That's that's really important because even I tell I tell you know women I mentor and, and others about even just starting a business. I mean, so the what you're saying is not unique to just nonprofits. It's about a business as well. You've got to sacrifice at the beginning uh, to get to where you need to be. And you know, and and if you're doing it like you talked about before with the, for the right reasons, God's gonna make it, make sure your your house is taken care of. Um, I mean, I I've had situations where I'm like, oh my gosh. I've been working, doing all this stuff for free. And I'm like, how am I going to pay this? And, you know, God, you know, look at God. He just something happened. So so that is very true as well. Um, I want to make sure I put this up because I said I was going. Huh, where did it go? Oh, um, I want to make sure um, that I put your website up here. BBCOnline.com dot com or dot org dot org dot org. OK. So I'm gonna put this up um, so that people know that that is where you can go to find out more information about building better communities um, and to donate because um, especially you mentioned about kids going back to school. I know um, Jamie and I were just talking about that earlier um, last week. Um, last week was the first two weeks of, of e-learning and so uh, the school district, they promised that every two weeks they would evaluate where things were and what the next step was. So um, they've been looking at, you know, when they'll transition to the hybrid. Um, but even once they transition to hybrid, uh, there's still going to be challenges on families. And so I know that you are doing things, particularly in that community, to make sure that um, you're able to support the, the community as um, or at least be able to support um the families as they're e-learning so um what what are some of the things what are some of the things that if people want to uh donate to you um cash is always good <laughs> yeah cash so, is always good but so that's not what we focus online. On, huh? but what else but what else uh what other needs do you guys have oh man we need laptops we need um devices we need tablets we need clothes um we need school supplies. We need, and I'll be honest with you, I, I tell people don't realize this, but we also need like like household items for parents to make their lives easier. You know, we we've gotten um, we've gotten where? Uh oh, you ready for me to? Yep. All right, let me go looking out for this. All right, can you hear me? Yep. Ah, uh, awesome, awesome. Okay. We, we've gotten so many different things over the years that you'll be amazed. I mean, we've even gotten cars for single moms that need cars. We've gotten um, tires, um, supplies they need for their, their vehicles. Anything that, um, you know, that a person could use, we, we, we try to get as donations. What I've done, and this is so crazy, I thought it was, I, I, I did an angel table. And what I did was I placed a table outside the BBC office that I would go and put donations on. So anybody walking by can grab. Now, let me tell you the problem with that. Somebody took the table. <laughs> so I'm assuming <laughs> somebody needed the table. So I got to put another one out. But we're trying to get together to put a locker out there. And so if people have stuff that they want to donate, they can donate it. And then if people need something, they can walk by and if they see something they need, take it. I only thing I ask is don't be greedy. Don't try to take it and sell it. If you really truly need it. I mean, we've we've given furniture, we've given um pots, pans, you know, just all kind of things, plates. People, if you were to go into some of these apartments and see what they don't have, simple things like couches, 
like beds, like um, TVs, like lamps they need for extra light, like a table to sit down and eat as well as do your homework. So these are the type of things that we always look for. Miss Regina E. Williams popped in. Yeah. She says, hi, I'm listening. She said, we in Booker Washington Heights appreciate building better communities. And Regina, of course, we appreciate you and all your leadership in the community. So, I, you know, we keep saying like she's talking about Booker Washington Heights and keep saying the colony and keep talking to office. We are assuming people know where your office is and we cannot do that. So let us know where is building better communities so that if people do have donations to bring to put on this table, they can do that. 3545 West Beltline Boulevard, Suite B. We are in the front of the colonies, right next to the City of Columbia Police Department substation. So we are right there. If you look through the window, you'll see Dr. King through the window. You'll see the resources we have in place, and we're there, and we love to have anyone stop by that wants. Now, we do have hours that you have to call in advance because of COVID, we just can't open the doors. But if you call 803-908-7775, we'd be glad to meet you, um, come out, or if there's a community meeting or something that we can help out with, we try our best to do that. Good. Meryl Johnson said, when I talk about money, he's all nonprofits love unrestricted funds. That that's good. I mean, because you you do like, especially if you're getting grants and stuff. Sometimes they're very restricted as to how you can use them. But you know, people's needs don't always fit into a nice little bucket. So having unrestricted funds is really important. So that that is so true. And um, I, I agree with that 100 percent because um, I'll be honest. You can start something off of a grant, and as soon as you start it, you realize, hold on, this grant is not going to affect the needs that I need to take care of. So, you know, yeah, you're right. Sometimes unrestricted funds are so important in communities like the Colony Apartments. So I would definitely be remiss if in the last few minutes we don't talk about, I, I know you you mentioned it, about part of the work, because you deal a lot with gun violence, part of the work you do, you, uh, you do a lot of work with law enforcement. Um, you know, we're at a, a very pivotal time in our, our country's um, history, um, but really as African-Americans in this country, um, recognizing, I think certainly as some of the sports sports uh, figures have said, you know, that we, we love this country even when this country doesn't love us. Um, and just, you know, watching just the, today, watching um, the new incident in um, Georgia, where a young man who was a passenger in a seat uh, was was beaten by two officers. And so, you know, it, it's really, it's hard to see all that. And it's like, you know, it, it really, you know, for a person who doesn't use curse words from me, I'm like, what the, I mean, you know, you just kind of like, what the, I mean, this is, I mean, it's like unbelievable sometimes. But as someone for me who works with law enforcement, I'm a city elected official. I've worked with our police department and I have great respect and admiration for our chief and deputy chief. Um, you know, I, I feel like there has to be, you know, we have to get through this. And I, I and, and, and sometimes you feel like you're walking up in line on how do you acknowledge people's pain and hurt and frustration and anger and, and allow that to come out. Um, but also, how do we push through and and recognize the law enforcement is is a needed part of our community? And how do we work with law enforcement to bring about the change that we want to see? Um, and so I have I, I have to ask you and let you speak to that because I think certainly as a black man, um, someone who has had a loved one who was killed by a police, <clears throat> um, someone who has seen the things that you've seen and work in the community and, and hear the hurt and frustration from the community, but also someone who works, you know, with law enforcement and has a good relationship with them. Um, how are you navigating where we are and what are some of the things that you feel like we need to, to work on as we start building better communities, as we start <laughs> building those bridges between our law enforcement um, and and our communities, particularly African-American communities. 
for the last for the 10 last years, years. We've, we've, we've talked about how we want to bridge that gap between our local communities and law enforcement. So I'm not only talking about it, but I actually go through and do the research and I be about it. Um, I'm part of the Richland County's um, Citizen Advisory Board. I have um, chief and assistant chief and deputy chief um, direct numbers um, saved in my phone. I have sheriff lots number saved in my phone and I called them on a constant basis. I probably aggravate them honestly, because I know that if when I do it, I'm coming at them out of, out of love and respect for the title, for the office, but I'm also coming out at them from the hurt and the anger from my community. So they need to hear someone not yelling at them, but trying to figure out resolutions. So I, I, I tread very lightly when I talk about my involvement with law enforcement, only because when you go into the community, people think you're a sellout. They think you're not black because you, you support police. But I tell them, I support police officers. I do not support police brutality. And there's a difference. So people have got to understand that. But instead of always yelling and screaming, you have to also learn how this, the, how things work. I don't want to say game because these are people's lives, but I've played sports all my life. So the only analogy that I can really show people is to say, hey, imagine playing football. You have rules, you have referees, you have other teammates, you have everything on the field that you need, but you have to know the playbook. If you don't know the playbook, you can't be effective in the game. You have to know police um, protocol. You have to know what is right. We for so long have thought that police were right in the way they treat us and thought that we deserve what we've got, that we've actually accepted it. And people could say, oh, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. But even that incident, and I, and I applaud Sheriff Lott for what he did, but you got to think, Sheriff Lott just fired and arrested an officer that assaulted a black woman that was in custody. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. And yeah. that woman never filed a complaint. So you can't tell me that somewhere we, we're lost in what we think should be happening. And so what we want to do is in that relationship that we have, we want to be fair. Listen, I want to teach everyone to know what police should and should not be doing. Every year until COVID, we did what we called how to conduct yourself during the traffic stop. We show you what police officers should be doing, what you should expect from an officer to come up to your car and what your rights are and how you can behave and get out of this situation. We tell people all the time, you don't fight a ticket on the side of the road. That's the worst place you can fight a ticket because then you allow that officer to become the judge and the juror. And a lot of times we lose on that. So I tell them all the time, open dialogue is key. So working with law enforcement is hard as a black man because I get so much I push back from my community. But then when something happens, what they don't say is, hey, I just called Bradley to ask him to help me get out of this. Or I just called Bradley to help me get out of that. And they don't talk about that, but they'll go, yeah, F the police, F the police. But then, hey, can you help me get out of this situation I just got in? And a lot of times, if you think about you know, what you're doing and, and your attitude, I tell people all the time, your attitude is what's going to get you out of most situations with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sam says, um, we just want the ones who break the law to be punished. Yeah. And, and we've got to hold everybody accountable from, you know, our law enforcement, our elected officials, our community leaders, um, our people in our community. And so we, we got to definitely do that. Um, um, and so um, my, my last final, final, final question for you um, is just so what is what is it that you would like to see? Like so when when it's like said and done um, and building better communities, everybody knows your name. What is it that you want people to think about when they hear building better communities? What's the legacy that you want this organization to have? I honestly don't um, really think about BBC's legacy. What I do think about though is our community. And so if you ask me truly what I would want to see, I would want to see our communities come together. And I would want, like when you talk about Black Lives Matter, 
and I know I'm probably gonna catch a lot of slack for this, but I want black lives to matter even when black people are killing us, not just when police are killing us or not just when the other race is killing us. I want our lives to be so important, so valuable, so cherished that if anybody, black, white, whatever, does anything to us, we won't stand for it. You know, we, we, we sit back and we make excuses all the time for what goes on in our communities, but we don't ever take the time to hold each other accountable. So if there's anything I would like to see is honestly unity within us, because I really think that it's going to take unity within the, our race and our communities before any other community is going to help us. And Meryl said, we're running out of time. So Meryl, we're going to get into your dissent in the firm. We, we, have, we, we need to have our, our, our socially distanced coffee or, or, or adult <laughs> beverage later. We can figure out what's the dissent in part and the firm in part. Um, but what I, I don't know if this is what Meryl's thinking. I, I think going back to what you said about even with law enforcement, like um, we've got communities who don't expect better. And so they just accept it. Um, I think that goes with within the, the crime within our communities as well. I mean, I know for the city, when we bought the shot spotter, we knew it we we were getting we were having shootings where no one was calling, but we had no idea until the shot spotter came and we saw the alerts that we get from shot spotter. Yeah. Um, and then the number of folks and I get people who tell me I'll be at a community meeting. And they'll say something and they'll say, well, we didn't call the police. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, I think that that, that's, that goes back to that overall, like we've got to, we've got to expect, um, we, you know, and I, I still say, you know, we got to go back to the fact that we, we have to have respect for ourselves and expect everybody to, to treat us with that respect. And so that's the law enforcement, that's the judicial system, that's our own communities. And, and so I think that that legacy does mean something of what you want to see in the community. We want when we see that in the community, that's going to that's going to be for law enforcement and everybody else. And I, I think it's going to happen. Um, yeah. This is I mean, people there are too many people who want it to happen and who are who are who are being involved. And so anyway, so with that said, I know we are down to our last bit. So I just have to say thank you so much for spending you. time, even though I know you had to travel and everything. I'm glad that you were able. Um, and those of you who are watching, you know, please go ahead and invite your friends and they can watch the replay. They can certainly find out more and then make sure that you go to uh, their website, bbconline.org and find out more about building better communities, how you can support their efforts, how you can get you, uh, yourself and your family and your young people involved in helping them. Like I said, Perry has an event and young people are all over. They're volunteering. They're in a part of the program. They're doing it all. And so um, get your young people involved. Um, and then, like I said, this is my community engagement week. And so tomorrow's a council day. So I won't be with you guys tomorrow, but Wednesday, um, join me again, Wednesday night. Um, I have to say it's scheduled for seven, but Watch my page because I may change that time just because I have another event for the Biden Harris campaign. Yes, vote. I'm voting for Biden Harris. And I've got another event that I'm trying to rearrange. So I may have to move that up or down. But anyway, Wednesday, whatever time, whether it's six, seven, or eight, sometime in there, I'm going to have Vivian Anderson with Every Black Girl. And she is doing phenomenal work in this community. And I, if you don't know about Every Black Girl, you need to. And I, I'm going to have a uh, uh, Vivian. And then on Thursday, I'm going to have Cassie Alia Ray with uh, Servant Connect and talk about all the great things that she's doing in the community. So anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being here. Thank you for just everything that I know there are so many folks. I'm just highlighting a couple organizations. I know there are other organizations out there that are doing great things. And if you want your organization, you want to want me to learn about your organization, reach out to me and, and we want to get y'all on as well. But anyway, um, until Wednesday at either six, seven or eight, <laughs> I am Councilwoman Speak Isaac Devine. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Community Conversations. Good night and God bless.